body respond to the lunar cycles? That's a question that I've been asking myself more recently and it's been coming up. The more I study astrology, the more I pay attention to the daily fluctuations in energy, Mercury retrograde, and I realize this is not just some kind of esoteric, ethereal kind of concept. This is real because what they said is going to happen in my emotional kind of guidance system is kind of happening. I am questioning my sense of happiness today. I am kind of questioning what's real for me today. And then the next day, like, that was that was yesterday. Today, I'm kind of like, man, I feel good. I feel inspired. I feel excited. Where yesterday, I was kind of like, I don't really, I want to teach the class, but God, I just, I don't feel up to it. And today, I'm like, let's go. Like, really excited. So that's something I think is amazing to get in tune with the, with the lunar cycles. And this drink that we're making today is based on that idea. So like alchemists, which are basically ancient herbalists and chemists that use um, herbs and different concoctions in the, in the past to create, you know, what's called the philosopher's stone or the longevity elixir, you know, the elixir that would kind of grant someone extended life or even immortality. And I like, the, I like that idea when I'm creating these things. I like the novelty of it. I like the idea that this isn't just kind of like hamburgers, fries, and milkshake. You know what I mean by that? Like just kind of things that we just take for granted and we just do. This to me is a, a signifies prosperity. Mm. It signifies heritage and um, historical reverence. You know, it taps me back into the avatars of the past. Mm -hmm. So when I consume this concoction that I'm sharing with you, um, I feel that kind of sense of nobility. It's, that's a cool feeling to have when we're talking about food mm -hmm. and substances that we integrate into our body. So, with all that said, let's get into it. Um, there were two processes I used to make this, and we're pretty familiar with this. It may be a different language, but we did something called a decoction and an infusion. And a decoction is basically where we boil something up to a certain heat temperature to break down some of the fibers, for example. Certain things that are decocted would be like roots, stems, barks, and even like um, what's called chitin fibers. That's what you find in like some of these medicinal mushrooms like reishi or shaga. They have very hard fibers that you can't really digest. You actually have to break it down with some kind of solvent. Generally, what we do is we do a hot water extraction, mm -hmm. and that's called a decoction. And the other process is called an infusion. And I infused passiflora, or passion flower, into water. And one of the great things about water is that it's a solvent. So it actually creates a solution with whatever you put into it, right? So if you put plastic into water or water into plastic, it will it will start to leach off some of the plastic into the water. So if you've tasted a water bottle, or I mean, if you taste a bottle of water, you may have noticed that, hey, this kind of tastes like plastic. Mm -hmm. And there's a good reason for that. And BPA free. And um, this right here is the same thing. So you're basically extracting certain compounds that are water soluble. So this is an important idea is that some things are water soluble, some things are fat or lipid soluble. And so an infusion would be one of three things. It would be water, it would be oil, like coconut oil, or cacao oil, which is why chocolate is one of the greatest delivery systems known to man, or it would be alcohol. These are all forms of, these are all types of solvents. They deliver other compounds into the body. So that's basically what this is. This has been seeping all day. And another word for an infusion is seeping, right? Like seeping your tea or steeping, I mean. We've all heard that, right? So it's the same, basically the same thing. Boiling, decocting, same thing. So I actually, I just did this for decorative purposes. I wanted to show you. I actually did this hours prior and infused it into a mamaki yeah. decoction or tea, Ooh. right? And so why I use mamaki, by the way, are we all aware of mamaki? No. Okay, mamaki is a Hawaiian-based form of nettle, basically. So it's in the nettle family, 
And what that means is that it's very high in silica. And silica is one of the most amazing minerals that I guarantee has an effect on our hormonal cascade. And there's a lot of people that are actually starting to come out to say silica has a silica deficiency has similar effects as fluoridosis in the brain, which is basically when we get too much fluoride in our pineal gland, some of our, our mental faculties start to shut down. It's a calcification in the pineal gland. Um, that's similar to a silica deficiency. Silica is actually a crystal that creates consciousness and also bone density. So that's a really cool thing about mamaki. And then we infuse that with passion flower. Now, the reason I use passion flower is one of two things. Well, two things, let's just say. One, for the hormone side, I talked about this idea that certain hormones like testosterone can convert into estradiol or estrogen, right? What that's called is aromatization. There's an enzyme called aromatase that, that kind of grabs on to loose androgens. I mean loose, that are not kind of held in place and grabs it and starts to manufacture it into an estrogen. It's uh, somehow our body has a recycling process that it goes through um, being in these physical bodies and that appears to be one of the main ways our body actually recycles us out. And if we're not on top of our diet, then we may recycle out a little early. That was one of Terrence McKenna's things too. Um, it's called distinction. So anyways, passion flower appears to actually have a compound called chrysin, which blocks that conversion. Wow. So in the bodybuilding world, they actually got onto this because what ends up happening or what did happen was in the early days, you had all these people that were, you know, obviously bodybuilding, putting a lot of stress on their body. Then they were also combining that with steroid enhancement, like testosterone and um, human growth hormone enhancement, synthetic enhancement. So what happens is they have this massive androgen increase, but they don't have any aromatase inhibitor. So if you notice, there's certain figures, like public figures, that were major bodybuilders. And once they turn about 50, they enter into andropause, and all that muscle <laughs> turns into flat. It turns into belly fat. It turns into just, it all drops down. Right? We've all kind of seen examples of that. Now, they found that that chemical in passion flower actually helps to hold on to testosterone instead of having it convert over. Does that make sense? Wow. So that's why we're using it. And also, passion flower is an MOAI. Has anyone ever heard that? No. Monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And I won't go too much into the story on that. Look it up. MOAI. It wow. has very interesting effects on our our serotonin, and our, our neurological capacity, but more so in the realm of like increasing what's called DMT or dimethyltryptamine. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll leave it on that. Passion flower basically helps calm the nervous system. It calms our head space, gets us more back into a creativity and a, a sense of love. That's why when you look it at this thing... oxygen, that's what he's saying. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, when you look at this, there's something called the doctrine of signatures. And you can see the phenotype of this amazing flower and the phenotype being its physical expression, the expression of its genetics. Mm -hmm. So it shows its genetic uh, complexity and its outer complexity. I mean, has anyone ever seen a flower like this? No. It smells so good. It looks like a UFO. It's it called the doctrine of... <laughs> the, it's called the doctrine of signatures. This is an ancient, like, herbal... Um, method where they would, before they had Wikipedia and iPhones, they would actually go into nature and observe what a plant looks like, what kind of environment it's in, like so based on the smell, mm -hmm. based on where it grows. So for example, we'll talk about one of our first ingredients, which is maca. Maca is a Peruvian root, root of a vegetable that grows in the Andes Mountains and it actually is the highest elevation crop that's grown in the world. So if we use the doctrine of signatures for that, what, what that's actually telling us is that it has a lot of oxygen yeah. or it creates a lot of oxygen because when farmers are going up um, to that kind of altitude, they start to, they start to have to, it's like being in Colorado, like if you're an athlete and you're going to the Olympics, one thing is you may be in like Palm Springs 
or LA. Then you go to Colorado where the training center is and it's it's a different altitude. Mm, so yeah. you actually have to you have to attune to the different climatic uh, environment, mm -hmm. right? So maca actually increases oxygen okay. in our lungs and it increases oxygen in our muscles. Mm -hmm. So it increases endurance and actually NASA actually took on like 30 years ago or something like that. NASA started supplementing their astronauts in the astronaut program with maca because obviously when astronauts are going up into outer atmosphere they lose their their oxygen capacity so maca actually happy. helps to increase that right and we're going to use that it has effects on your your hormones as well but mm -hmm. we're going to move on